Well, listen, I'm excited about the theme for Christmas and, uh, and uh, the, the hope, how uh, the heart of Christmas, and we're going to be looking at this theme. And every year we try to do something that makes it fresh and alive and because Christmas shouldn't be stale and boring. You know that? It should be some of the most exciting times for us as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. And uh, so hopefully this morning as we l- share this first Sunday of Advent together, that's exactly what we do. We have a fire in us about what Christmas is all about. And so, um, so I'm, ex- I'm excited about our theme for this Christmas and I'm excited the Christmas season is finally here. How many of you are excited about Christmas season? All right. How many of you are just faking it? All right. All right. <laughs> there you go. I really do enjoy Christmas. And matter of fact, I want to say a special thanks to everyone that was in here working this week to kind of do all the Christmas decorations. Everything just looks great. And uh, they've been, they were working really hard. And uh, I just really appreciate it so much. And and, uh, and they, a lot of them, they say, well, I don't do this at my own home, but, um, but pastor wants it this way, so we're going <laughs> to do it. I said, well, there's got to be some benefits to being in charge, right? And so uh, <laughs> I just absolutely love Christmas. And uh, so I'm glad that Christmas is finally here and that we can share this time together. And hopefully we'll begin to see the evidence and hear the evidence of that all around us. And so anyway, so exciting. You love cleaning up the glitter, do you, Jeff? There you go. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff is our official glitter ministry cleaner-upper. And so, so just to let you know that. Well, yeah, lots, we'll, we'll make it a lot of work for him. Well, we're so thankful that you're here this morning. It is wonderful to be together. And uh, I'm excited about going into this new sermon series and uh, how we're going to look at the four main themes at the heart of Christmas and uh, those four themes, you've probably, if you've been around the church very long, you know what they are. They talk about hope and peace and joy and love, just the main themes of the heart of Christmas. And um, I, hope, I hope as we go through this series that it's just not a bunch of words, but it's something that brings the Christ of Christmas alive to every, each one of us. And so, uh, so during this series, we're going to have a great time doing that. Today we're going to discover the hope that is at the heart of Christmas. And, and if you have your sermon notes, you can sort of join along with the message and follow along that way. And, uh, and those online, um, you, don't, you don't have sermon notes, but there's going to be some perks to being here in person, right? And so uh, we have sermon notes available, but we can get them available to you. And so we're going to be looking at the hope that comes through the birth of Jesus Christ. The hope that comes through the birth of Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but after everything we've gone through, and and hear me this morning, after everything we've gone through, I could use a little hope. I could use some encouragement. I can use a reminder to tell me that everything that's going on in this world today, all the the chaos and all the difficulties and all the, the financial things that go on, all the challenges that we're facing, we need to be reminded of the hope that is ours or could be ours as we put our faith in Jesus Christ. The prophet Isaiah, and um, and he writes in the Old Testament, probably one of the most classic of all Old Testament prophecies, he writes about the coming birth of Christ. And the passage he writes, and we're going to read it in just a moment, the passage is found in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 to 7. We're going to read it in just a moment, but before we read that passage, I think we need to be reminded of what was happening back in the time of Isaiah when he wrote this. Because when Isaiah wrote this passage, it was a time of incredible gloom and darkness. Um, the, you, you can call it the full weight of sin was... Uh, sort of wreaking havoc on the the people of Israel. And in the midst of all that darkness and all that difficulty, along comes a prophecy that is given. And Isaiah shares that prophecy with us in Isaiah 9. And we're going to read it in just a moment. But that prophecy that Isaiah shared in chapter 9 was something that the Jewish people of that time really needed. They needed to have some hope in their life. And hope that one day someone would come along and make things right. You ever had that feeling yourself? 
You ever go through circumstances that you're up against? Maybe some financial struggles, maybe uh, raising your children, maybe um, health issues, whatever it may be, and you're up against those struggles and you're just hoping that something will come along and make things better and make things right. Well, the people of Israel at that time, in the midst of all their darkness, that's exactly what they were doing. They were hoping that someone would come along and set them free from all the, 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 the sin and, and the weight of that sin that they were experiencing in that, at that time. And so the birth of Jesus was the fulfillment of that hope. And so we're going to read Isaiah 9 this morning, and I want to read it from the New Living Translation. Isaiah 9, and we're just going to read this as our, our main text, and it's, a, again, one of those classic Old Testament prophecies that when Christmas comes, you can't ignore, and you have to remind yourself of it, and we're going to talk about why you should do that. Beginning to read a verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 9, says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light, a light that will shine on all who live in the land where, where death casts its shadows. Israel will again be great, and its people will rejoice as people rejoice at harvest time. They will shout with joy like warriors dividing the plunder. For God will break the, the chains that bind his people and the whip that scourge, scourges them, just as, just as he uh, did when he destroyed the army of Mid Midian uh, with Gibeon's little band. In, the day of, in that day of peace, Battle gear will no longer be issued. Never again will uniforms be bloodstained by war. All such equipment will be burned. For a child is born to us, a son given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. These will be his royal titles. Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Mighty God Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, his ever-expanding, peaceful government will never end. He will rule forever with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David. The passionate commitment of the Lord Almighty will guarantee this. Wow. That is a great Old Testament prophecy that is so important that we're reminded, that we're reminded of during this Christmas season. It's an Old Testament prophecy that the people of Israel needed that, at that time in the midst of all their difficulty. And then even to this very day, it's the true reason why there is hope at the heart of our Christmases, even in 2022. Hope is at the heart of our Christmas because unto us a child was born, and his name is Jesus. Today, we need to celebrate that. We need to realize that the gifts and the, the hope that we have is not because of, of the gifts and, the, and that we give one another and all the wrappings and tinsel, but it's because of the birth of Jesus Christ. There are some people in our world today who say, oh, we don't celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And, and, and I just I don't understand it, especially if you're a Christ follower, because his birth is what began to give us the, the freedom that we have today through our Savior, Jesus Christ. He was born. He came and lived an earthly ministry. His arrival on earth was the fulfillment of a prophecy that was spoken literally hundreds of years ago. That prophecy is one of the most well-known passages that are, is shared during this time of the year. And so the backdrop of that whole passage and that whole time is that they were a people who were living in darkness. They were a people who were living under poor leadership. And even this morning during the Advent candle, when Andy and Sherry were sharing that, um, it highlighted that, that the different empires that they were beaten up by at that time. Even their own leadership was poor and ungodly. They had, their king was King Uzziah, their king was Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, and they were awful kings. They were awful kings. And it was during that time that they were just feeling so lost and so far from God. The people at that time had become corrupt and, and they forgot about their history as God's people. It was a very dark time in history. Isaiah wrote the words that he did there in chapter 9. He knowing that God would have to intervene to bring Israel back to himself. The kingdom was crumbling. People were hurting. The world was broken and the people needed hope. 
when you begin to look at that passage, and we're going to jump into that because I think, beyond a shadow of a doubt, we need hope today in a fresh way. We need to be reminded that in this world where sometimes you think sin is winning, sometimes where you think, why, does it really pay to follow Jesus? The answer is yes, it does. And sometimes we can lose sight of that because of the darkness that's around us and the things that you're going through. It's interesting to me that in Isaiah chapter 9, and that, those verses 2 to 7, there are two major statements that come out of it. Now notice this, two major statements. The first one is an acknowledgement of the brokenness and the darkness that surrounded Israel because of the sin and corruption. They acknowledged it. Sometimes it's so hard today for us to even acknowledge that we live in a broken world. Sometimes we want to put our rose-colored glasses on, maybe like some of the, uh, the, 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 the covering that's on these lamps behind me. We like to put our covering on and look at the world and say, oh, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. But if they were ever going to really find freedom and find hope, and started when they first acknowledged the brokenness around them, today I would say the same thing. Sometimes in your home, in my home, the things that we want to overcome and we want to be more than conquerors over will only start when we begin to recognize that, you know what, not everything's perfect. Matter of fact, it might even be broken. It might even be corrupt. It might even be a sin in play that's causing us to lose our way. And so one of the major things they did back then is they acknowledged that. And I want to ask us this morning, how quick are we to acknowledge when we have gone off course and not really been what God wants us to be. God wants us to get back on course. He loves us so much. He wants the very best for us. But the only way to do that is to acknowledge sometimes the brokenness and the darkness that surrounds us. The second thing I notice in this passage is that hope of a dawning light only came through the birth of a child who would one day make things right. You and I live in an incredible day. We get to live in the aftermath of Jesus' birth. And not only his birth, but his death and his resurrection, where he appeared to over 500 witnesses. And we get to live today, here in 2022, we don't get to really put our hope in something that didn't happen. We know that it happened. We know literally history, secular history, records that a man named Jesus would lived and, and he died and supposedly rose again. You and I are living in the aftermath of something that happened. And it happened because he was to be that dawning light. He was to be the one that would make things right. The Jewish people back then, they didn't have that. They just had the prophecy. They didn't know for sure that it, 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 it had happened. They didn't have secular writings or historians to give them the evidence that they needed. They were just hoping that the Savior would come and make things right. What a time they lived. And so when we begin to fast forward and go into the New Testament and we look into Matthew, Matthew begins to tell us how this hope began to unfold. And Matthew is reminded of Isaiah's writings. Matter of fact, I'm not going to read it this morning, but Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 to 23, Matthew is, is reminded of what Isaiah wrote hundreds and hundreds of years ago about the child that was about to be born. And you know the story. A young Jewish man named Joseph was presented with a very difficult decision. Can you imagine? You're dating this girl, and she comes to you and says, hey, I'm pregnant, but don't worry, I didn't have sexual relations, it's from the Lord. Yeah, right, yeah, 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 I've heard them all, but I never heard that one before, all right? So he had a very difficult decision to make. He was engaged to be married to, to Mary, uh, and with her already being pregnant, he planned to call the wedding off, and, and he appeared that uh, his bride-to-be was unfaithful, but yet the angel of the Lord came along and said to Joseph in a dream and told him, no, no, go forward with the marriage. This is of the Lord. This is of God. The child in her womb was put there by the Holy Spirit. And so all of those events were a fulfillment of that Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah 9. Hundreds of years later, for unto us a child was born. 
And he would be born as a light into the darkness. He would be born as a hope to all people. And so that child would be named Emmanuel, which means God's with us. So I give you all that background, okay? You ready for your test? We're going to do a test now, see if you, re- you heard everything I just said. But all that background is this. I want to give you very quickly three things that you should take away from this and apply to your life, very quickly, all right? I'll only be another couple of hours. You'll be okay, all right? No, not really. Number one, the presence of darkness threatens our hope. Uh, same to true, that's true for today as well. The th- The presence of darkness threatens our hope. The center of the Christmas story is focused squarely on the birth of Jesus, and that's where it should be. That's why this morning we have the cross here that we put on the back wall at the heart of Christmas, and the manger scene is that the focus should be squarely on the birth of Jesus. He is the fulfillment of Israel's hope that they had, that God would push back the darkness and shine a bright light into the world. Jesus is the one who would do that. And so one of the reasons Christmas resonates so much in my heart today is because I think we live in a world that is similar to Israel. Sometimes we say, well, here in our comfortable little city of Stratford, we don't have all the problems that they had back then. But you know what? I've traveled enough to know that when you go in other parts of the world, when you begin to encounter all kinds of darkness and witchcraft and and all kinds of different things, we do live in a world that is full of incredible brokenness and darkness. And sometimes we feel, because maybe we don't see it firsthand ourselves, we forget that this world is much bigger than our own lives. But yet, maybe even some of our homes, we know what it is to go through those, those dark times. And so I believe with all my heart that the presence of darkness in our world today threatens our hope. Sometimes there are people today who are no longer following Jesus because sin won over them. Darkness won over them and got them off course and they're no longer following Christ. Our world is dark and corrupt and oftentimes we're caught up in sin that so easily entangles us. There is war, disease, conflict, oppression all around us. I believe with all my heart that we too need to be reminded that we are in need of the Christ child. We need him to usher light into our lives and to push back the darkness around us. We need him. We need a Savior today, 2022. We like to think sometimes we're different, but we're not. The same heart and the same spirit that existed back then in in that world of darkness is the same heart and the same spirit that exists in this world today. We have the same capabilities. And so every year, I love Christmas because I'm reminded that in the midst of all this, we can find hope. And that hope is found in Jesus and found in the Christ child. Christmas is a reminder that that whatever is going on, that our hope that we need for our lives, if you need healing, if you need restoration, if you need a better marriage, if you need to deal with some difficult in-laws, all right? (laughs) I thought I'd throw that in there to see if I can get someone who, who perk up. It's amazing how the eyes just pop up, all right? But when you need help in all of that, if you need a fresh start in your life, if you need to hit the reset button in your life, It is available to you through Emmanuel, God, who's with us today to give us hope. As I put in your notes, hope is not the result of the absence of conflict. If you think that's what hope is, you're mistaken. Hope comes to you in the midst of the conflict, in the midst of the difficulty, in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the trial. Hope is the result that comes into your life because of the presence of God and nothing else. Sometimes we're waiting for a perfect world, for everything to fall into place and to live the way that we, th- we think we ought to live. But you know what? Hope is here now through the birth of Christ. And every year I love Christmas because Christmas pushes back the darkness that sometimes 
crowds into us. That's why I love the lights and the, and the and trees and stuff and all the things that go on. Some of it has absolutely nothing to do with Christmas, but I'll take whatever I can get that will help us to push back the darkness and say, no, this is about the birth of Christ and how he came to give us hope in our lives. I'll take it. I'll take whatever I can take to give us hope. Number two, God's presence has come to give us hope. That's why, that's why Jesus was born. That's why we have the birth of the Savior. He came to give us that hope. And so God's presence, and if without it, we would never have that hope. The hard part about hope is, especially for the Israelites back then, is they were told, it's going to come. It's going to come. It's going to happen. Hey, you just hang on. It's going to happen. The hard part was they had to believe it was coming. And the hard part about hope is that it often takes longer than we would like to be fulfilled. Isn't that true? Hope, and putting our hope in something, often takes longer than what we would like. But, like the Jewish people experience, hope requires patience. Now, every year at Christmas, my family knows that the worst thing they can do to me at Christmas time, and my son did it to me the other day, the, the wretch, and he... He told me, he said, Dad, I bought your gift today. And I'm thinking, you know, that's the worst thing you could ever say to me because I want to know what it is now. How many of you snoop in the gifts? All right, the Lord's watching here, all right? All right, how many snoop in the gifts? I, I, I must admit, I'm going to come out and come clean. I like, <laughs> I like to snoop. And so... Because it's the worst thing. I just don't like waiting. I want to know what the gift is. I want to know now. You know, uh, do I, do I, you know, I'm trying to figure out, okay, now I know what the gift is. What kind of response should I give? You know, should I get really excited or go, you know, you got to figure out what your response is. And so hope is something that requires patience. And for me, when it comes to Christmas time and waiting to see what my gift is, it just, it's, it's hard being patient. And don't look at me that way. You're the same way, all right? <laughs> and so we need to be reminded that God's presence has come to give us hope. And sometimes it takes a little bit longer than what we like to experience. Sometimes what you're looking for in your, in your home and in your life, be patient, folks. God's at work. Your Savior is alive. And he cares about you, and he's come to give you hope. Your hope is not found in the government. Your hope is not found in your best friend. Your hope that you really need in your life that will see you through everything that you're going to face is found in the Christ child. Isaiah saw that one day in the future, God would bring a great light, and salvation would come through the birth of a child. It was not until the hundreds of years later that Matthew recorded Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. Jesus is the very presence of God on earth. Hallelujah. He offers forgiveness. He, dis he breaks down the barriers of evil. And he gives incredible promises that we just talked about in our last message series. Particularly the promise of eternal life. Wow. So every year, why do we read the, this prophecy from Isaiah? I think we read Isaiah's prophecy each year at Christmas because we need to be patient. We need to be reminded that the hope we're looking for and the promise that Jesus said, I'm coming again, just like they had to wait for the Christ child to come, we have to wait when Jesus says, I am coming again to make things right. You need to be patient. Hope is on the way. The Apostle Paul made an appeal for hope and to remind everyone who trusts in Jesus Matter of fact, he said in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, he said, such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. Notice this verse, verse 4, Romans 15, verse 4. Such things, such as that prophecy from Isaiah, were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us, and the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promise to be fulfilled. This morning, you may be facing some things that are difficult in your life, but I want to encourage you. Put your hope in the Lord. Don't give up on God. 
Lean in closer to him. Let him show you that he will not let you down, that his promises are faithful and true. Be patient. And I think every year we need to be reminded of that patience as we read about the patience of the Israelites. They had to wait hundreds of years before the Son of God came. And I hear people saying to me, oh, we've heard forever that God's coming back. You know, when's it going to happen? Be patient. Don't give up hope. Focus your hope on Christ and what he promised that he said he would do. He fulfilled the prophecies of Isaiah and he'll fulfill the prophecies yet to come. So finally, not only do we need to be reminded that the presence of darkness threatens our sense of hope today, and you may be feeling that firsthand, but we need to be reminded that God's presence has come to give us hope. And lastly, at the heart of Christmas, here it is, this is why we have the heart, at the heart of Christmas, hope is at the heart of it all. Christmas has many different distractions, many different things that go on. Matter of fact, uh, I, I'm just amazed at the number of ways that you can go shopping now. Um, growing up, I, shopping was, I had to go get in the vehicle on a Friday night with my parents. I had to go down to Stedman's, which was a, a, a shopping store that doesn't exist anymore, like a lot of shopping places don't. And that's the only way we can go shopping. I had to get my shopping in on Friday night at Stedman's. They, I, they probably had one of everything, um, but, um, but most of the stuff, nobody wanted. Anyway, so that you had to do your shopping from them. That's how we did our Christmas shopping. Now, you know, Helen and I are driving to an event yesterday, and she's in the car shopping. You know, oh, get that. Oh, yes, get that, get this. It's like I'm sitting there and going, I'm amazed at how quickly we could spend money. And, and it, it, just, it just shocks me. And so you don't even have to wait any time. You can get up in the middle of the night and go shopping. Do you know, what, an, what a world we live in. And some of you probably do that, right? You can't sleep, so you go, you go shopping. We, we just realize that there are so many things, if we're not careful, will distract us from what Christmas is all about. Hope is at the heart of Christmas. The Christ child is at the heart of Christmas. And we need to be reminded of that. I want to close with this story. It's a story that was told by Dr. James Dobson from Focus on the Family. And, and apparently it's a true story. And I want, to, I want to close with this story. I just thought it illustrates this point so well, how hope should be at the heart of all of our Christmases as well. Dr. Dobson tells the story of an elderly woman named Stella Thornhope. And Stella was someone who was struggling with her first Christmas alone. Her husband had died just a few months prior. And he had a slow developing cancer. And uh, several days before Christmas, uh, he passed away. And so at that Christmas, when she no longer had her husband by her side, she was alone. It was her first Christmas alone. She was almost snowed in by a brutal weather system that came across that day. And she was terribly alone. She had missed her husband in just a, a huge way. And, and um, so she was so alone that she decided that she wasn't going to decorate the house for Christmas. She wasn't going to put up the tree or anything. Late that afternoon, the doorbell rang. And there was a delivery boy who was at the door. And he had a box in his hand. And he said, Mrs. Thornhope, would you sign here? And he held out a clipboard with a paper on it for her to sign. It was so cold out she invited him to step inside and, and close the door and just come in for a moment and get out of the cold. And, um, and so she signed the paper and she said, what's in the box? And the young man, he kind of laughed and he said, he opened up the flap and, he, and inside the box was a little golden Labrador retriever. Yeah, it just kind of melts your heart, doesn't it? Yeah, The delivery boy picked up the, that squirming puppy and he held it out to her and said, this is for you, ma'am. He's six weeks old and he's completely housebroken. The young puppy began to wiggle and, 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 and squirm about and, and Mrs. Thornhope said, well, who sent this? 
And the young man set the, 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 the puppy down and he handed her an envelope and he said, it's all explained here in this envelope, ma'am. The dog was bought last July while its mother was still pregnant. It was meant to be a Christmas gift for you. The young man then handed her a book, and the book said, How to Care for Your Labrador Retriever. At this time, she was becoming very desperate to know the details of what was going on. She said, Well, who sent me this puppy? And as the young man turned to leave, he said to her, Your husband, ma'am. Merry Christmas. She opened the letter from her husband that he had written, and he had written it three weeks before he died. And he left it with the, the, the kennel owners to be delivered with the puppy as his last Christmas gift to her. The letter was full of love and encouragement and all the things that a husband would say, admonishments to her to be strong and while he was gone. He vowed that he was sitting and waiting for her and that one day they would be together in heaven. He sent her this young animal to keep her company and to, and, and to make sure she wasn't lonely. So, needless to say, she began to wipe away the tears. She put the, the letter down and she picked up the puppy. And she picked up that fur ball and, and uh, held it to her neck. And, and then she began to look out the window and notice the neighbor's Christmas lights. And she began to hear the radio in the kitchen that was playing that song, Joy to the World, the Lord has come. And suddenly Stella felt the most amazing sensation of hope washing over her. Her heart became full of joy and, and wonder again, even in the midst of her grief and her loneliness. And she finally said to her dog, let's go and get those Christmas gifts or Christmas decorations out of the attic. I love that story, not because it, I was bawling like a baby in my office when I, when I was reading it, but I love that story because I think it illustrates for us that in the midst of our loneliness and when we think things are hopeless, God comes along and says, oh, no, they're not. And if you open your eyes and begin to see, God has wonderful ways of sending hope into your life and into my life. And so we need to be reminded, like Stella, that hope will come to us in different ways and maybe in times that we don't even fully understand. Our God this morning, folks, is always right on time. He was right on time when he came and when he gave the prophecy to Isaiah, he was right on time when Mary and Joseph had to deal with that difficult decision. And God is right on time with your life and mine. He knows exactly what we need. And we can trust him that he'll reveal that light. He'll reveal that need. And he will push back the darkness in our life. He will open up things for us. He will help us to be victorious where we think there is no victory. And even though our land may be full of deep darkness, God will always be a light that will shine into that darkness. So this morning, as we begin this first Sunday of this Christmas, 2022, I'm inviting you to get excited about Christmas. Not because of all the wrappings in the tinsel, but to get excited about the hope that Christ came to give you and I and to give our families. Yesterday, that event we went to was my daughter, you know, they do these gender reveals these days um, when you're having a baby. And of course, in our day, we just kind of wait until the doctor was done slapping the baby and we found out, <laughs> we found out what gender it was. But my daughter was having a gender reveal and I didn't, I was just... I couldn't believe how giddy I was uh, about it because I went, I had a, a my, most of you know, I am, I'm a man that can wear pink. I wear pink, all right? And so I put my pink shirt on. I said, it's going to be a girl. I, I want a girl. I'll take whatever I can get, but I want a girl. And so when we went to the gender reveal, they had this elaborate thing. They had a football that was stuffed with um, either pink or blue, all right? Um, and... And, and so it was so exciting. And when, he, when she passed the football to my, my son-in-law and he grabbed it, I was hoping he wouldn't miss, and, and he gave it a kick and the pink powder flew everywhere. I was just so excited. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I have four grandsons. I wanted a girl, all right? It was so exciting. 
just to be a part of that. I think in some ways we need to remind ourselves in this world that sometimes looks so bleak that when you put your hope in Christ, he has a way of bringing joy to you from all four corners of this world. He has a way of speaking into your life that you never thought possible. And so right here at the beginning of this Advent season, I want to invite you to express your hope, not in the world around us, but in God, in Christ. And that you would see Jesus in a fresh way and let him do something fresh within your family, within your home. Let him make a difference where you thought there could never be any difference. Let him give you hope. Let's stand together in closing. Lord, this morning I want to thank you for my church family. I thank you, God, for the love that we have for one another. I thank you for the way you keep our hearts tender. Because in this world it's so easy to become hard-hearted. It's so easy to become callous because of the darkness sometimes we see happening around us. And, and it's so easily broadcasted through our, through our electronic devices and digitally. It's broadcasted across our TVs. And we can become hard if we're not careful because of all the evil that takes place in our world. And so, Father, this morning on this first Sunday of Advent, I'm asking, Holy Spirit, that you would somehow make our hearts pliable and tender and sensitive once again to that incredible message that you came to give us hope. So Lord, right now, if there's someone here today that's discouraged and someone that's struggling to find their way forward, God, don't let them give up. But Lord, let them find you. Let them find you. And you're the one who has come to give us hope. And that's at the heart of what Christmas is all about. And so Lord, today... Speak to us and encourage us and love us and lift our spirits as we go forward in the name of Jesus. And I ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.